Thank you. Uh, welcome. It's delightful to see so many people here. Um, the topic of spies seems to be endlessly fascinating. It just packs out houses all over the country. Um, I'm here today to tell you about a, um, a very brilliant spy who was a very bad man. And uh, we'll get to whether those things and in what ways those two things are related. The, uh, uh, the strange psychological makeup of people of that sort of mid-century generation who spent their lives deceiving everyone around them. But first, uh, I want to just run you through the basics of the story. How did this man, Richard Zorge, Zorge, actually, strangely enough, is, a, uh, is an adjective. It means melancholy, Mr. Melancholy, although he certainly was not melancholy in his life and work. He was hyperactive, priapic, and extremely danger-loving. So the misnamed Richard Zorge was a man with a fatherland and a motherland. He was born in an expatriate German family in Baku, the oil city in the Caucasus, capital of Azerbaijan, in the Russian Empire in 1895. His father was an oil engineer. His mother was the daughter of a local merchant. She was Russian, but she didn't speak Russian at home. And he spent the first years of his life as an expatriate in, the, uh, in, the, in living in considerable luxury in a suburb of Baku. And that's one of the things I think that uh, many spies have in common, in fact, the sense of otherness. I think Zorge never really felt that he belonged in the society in which he grew up. He always, he wrote in his prison memoir, sorry, it's a bit of a spoiler, he gets hanged in the end. Sorry, <laughs> you, you, you do, I should, it is actually in the first introduction of the book anyway. So. Uh, in his prison memoir, he wrote, he, he, he writes that he, you know, he felt from his childhood this sense of not belonging to this bourgeois world of first Baku expatriate life, and then later his father moved to Berlin, where they lived uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a wealthy suburb, uh, and his father became a banker. So rather like Kim Philby, and there's actually rather a lot of similarities between the life of Richard Zorge and the life of Kim Philby, and their, particularly their backgrounds as well. He grew up in privilege, but he didn't really feel part of that world. And uh, Kim Philby wrote, in order to betray, you must at first belong I never belonged. And I think you could say exactly the same thing about Richard Zorge. And the major event that set his life in train, his, his career in train as a spy, was the same event that united, traumatized, slaughtered so many of that generation. It was what the Germans called the, the Kindermord, the, the massacre of the innocents, the experience of fighting on the Western Front. And Zorge joins up in 1914 as a young, idealistic German patriot, unthinking, you know, like we've all read up Philip Larkin, August 1914, you know, young men all across Europe having no idea of the sort of the, the slaughter they, they were signing up for, uh, sign up, uh, including Zorge, uh, within six months, within eight months, he's on the, the River Isar in Belgium uh, in a student battalion, and he, which is largely massacred. And... Uh, to get a sense of the trauma and the profound personal impact of that war, you, the most lyrical, uh, not really lyrical, but the most powerful um, exam, uh, writing about that is not actually Zorge. It's someone who was almost exactly his age, who fought uh, in very similar areas of the Western Front, and was in fact wounded in the next door hospital in 1916 was Adolf Hitler. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler describes the absolute rage that he feels, that the old world has betrayed him and his generation, and has massacred and caused this mass pointless slaughter, and the old world must be broken, says Adolf Hitler. And precisely the same in precisely the same way, this young banker's son, Richard Zorge, finds himself filled with rage at the old world. And Hitler, as we know, goes into, creates his own national socialism. Uh, and, but a whole generation of communists, and Richard Zorge among them, find this wellspring of idea of, of motivation in that 
disappointment and, 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 and in, in that horror. And in practical terms, actually, he is in hospital where one of his nurses uh, gives him, starts giving him uh, communist literature and he starts reading his way to enlightenment as he, as, 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 uh, as he, as he uh, puts it. And he, the forced confinement of a hospital bed, I think also sows profound restlessness in him. And he joins the, the cohort of young men of his generation who become radical communists. And of course, we now tend to associate Russia immediately, first and foremost, with communist revolution. But actually, strangely enough, uh, the Bolsheviks themselves, the ideologues of Bolshevism, thought that Germany was much more likely to go Bolshevik. And the German proletariat is much bigger. It's much more ripe a place for a communist revolution. And in fact, there were, we again sort of tend to forget this, how close Germany came to becoming a Bolshevik communist country. There were at least, depending on how you count them, five or six revolutions between 1918, the Spartacists, and in uh, 1923, there was the Red Ruhr, Munich. There were various out uprisings. And the young Richard Zorge was very involved as a communist activist. He was a he lectured students in Kiel. He was pursuing an academic career. In fact, he became an economist um, after the end of the war, after demobilization. He first he tried to study as a doctor, became an economist, and so on. But also, all this time, he was also a... Uh, an underground agitator. In fact, quite literally an underground agitator because he, he, he signed up to work in a mine to agitate the miners. So it, it, he became actually a real underground agitator in a mine. So uh, this uh, young man, very passionate, very, uh, um, very uh, didactic, having a sort of uh, slightly pedantic, high opinion of himself. He's an academic. He's actually, throughout his whole life, as a communist, strangely enough, he never loses this sense of his sort of patrician in what we would today call entitlement. Is that actually, he's constantly, even when he's working as a spy later in his career, he's always sort of talking down and just generally being rude to, to, his, to his subordinates and just sort of uh, and bossing people about. So, 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 so he's, he always considers himself to be sort of officer class. But to cut a long story short, he is identified by Russian agents of the Communist International, a Moscow-run organization designed to spread world revolution. He is recruited by the Communist International, does various spying work for them in, throughout the 1920s. Then uh, at the end of the 1920s, he is sent to Shanghai. Shanghai is, at that point, the, the entrepot of the East, of Asian trade. It's also basically a colonial city, although it's not actually formally a colony, but various chunks of central Shanghai are controlled by various colonial powers, self-governing, self-regulating colonial powers. And also, importantly, if you're a spy, it also has four separate police forces, none of whom talk to each other. So that's really very handy, is you have a city which is divided into little bits. One of them is the international settlement, which is basically the English settlement, which is the one you want to avoid because its police force is run by Northern Irishmen. So they're very sort of serious about their security. And in fact, they were very, they, they, the, the British special branch uh, were actually extremely effective at, at, at rolling up communists, in fact, in London and in Shanghai both. Uh, you have the French, who are obviously less, you know, the, 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 they obviously, sorry, I didn't mean obviously, they are less <laughs> concerned with security. Uh, you have the Chinese, you have the, the Japanese, uh, um, you have a, a small sort of nascent Japanese concession, and you have uh, the local Chinese police, which control the entire mainland on behalf of the sort of falling, ailing uh, nationalist government. So Zorge starts to arrive in this city, which is the capital of espionage in the 30s. And in that period, more or less every sort of great illegal Soviet agent that ever operated anywhere some point pops up in, in Shanghai. And he has, uh, he has a very successful career. He's um, where he identifies the, the things that become the sort of the, the planks, the bulwarks of his successful espionage. And they're really simple. It's just by being incredibly charming. He's just a really very charming, personable man. 
And I think, I mean, th this, uh, we, can just, we can talk about this in the, in the Q&A afterwards, but the, the way espionage has changed over the, 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 the intervening 80 years. But in, that, in those glory days when human intelligence was everything, it was just getting information out of people, Zorge basically didn't ever in his career steal any secrets. People gave him secrets. They told him secrets and he traded secrets. He was just a very personable man. And men wanted him, wanted to be him, M women wanted him. He was extraordinarily uh, charming, promiscuous sexually. And he uh, was actually in many ways the prototype of James Bond. In fact, Ian Fleming does write about that, that the, the, the Zorge sort of uh, swashbuckling, uh, uh, nightclub hopping, uh, man about town was one of the models of, uh, of, of James Bond, the sort of Soviet James Bond. But the most interesting part of his career ensues in, uh, not in Shanghai, where he acquits himself perfectly respectively, but in the next and most dangerous stage, uh, where Zorge goes from just being a rather good, effective, everyday spy to being a world historical figure. And he creates probably one of the greatest spy networks in the world in Tokyo, Japan, intensely mysterious to the Soviets, intensely dangerous to the Soviets, because this newly hatched imperial power, which has defeated imperial Russia in 1904 to 1905, has suddenly spread over into Manchuria in 1931. They start to expand into huge swathes of mainland China and acquire a large land border with Siberia. So obviously the, the Soviets are really very interested to know what are the, are, the, are the Japanese doing. And Zorge creates, is sent into this totally spy-mad country with a very powerful, not, not just no police forces that speak to each other, but actually five in, in, interlocking, overlapping police forces that very much do talk to each other. You've got the TOCO, the military intelligence, and so on. So th this is actually a police state with a very tiny expatriate community, which are very physically obvious, unlike in Shanghai, where you've got sort of many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of Westerners. In, in, in Tokyo, they're very rare. So what does he do? He creates t essentially two parallel spying networks. One of them, and the most important one, based on his charm aforementioned. Uh, because he uh, decides to do two things. One, he, well, he and his bosses decide that he doesn't, he's not going to hide. He's not going to go under assumed identity. He's not going to go and pose as something else. He's, he's not going to have what they the Russian spies, Soviet spies at that time, described as a boot, a false identity, a constructed identity. No, he was just going to go as Richard Zorge, journalist, because he was Richard Zorge, journalist. He actually hid in absolutely plain sight. And that was actually um, a brilliantly simple uh, and effective cover, because he was, in fact, actually rather a uh, I, I read his article, so you don't have to, but it's it, a rather pedantic, <laughs> rather sort of, you know, uh, plodding, but nonetheless a successful journalist. And he becomes the, the, the correspondent for, for, the, for the Frankfurter Zeitung, which is the most prestigious German paper at the time. So there's no, there's no subterfuge. He just hides in plain sight. And his main source is a man who, to whom he has obtained letters of introduction, a man called Eugen Ott, a lieutenant colonel in the German army, former intelligence officer in fact, who is posted to Japan and who is given to Zorge as a contact. As it turns out, Eugen Ott becomes firstly the military attaché and then the ambassador. The German ambassador to Tokyo is a very important position. He's a very important and interesting man to know because, as you know, Germany and Japan later go into a military alliance. So that sort of nexus of the Germ you know, Nazi Germany's representative in Imperial Japan is a key man to know. And he is best friends with Richard Zorge, despite the fact uh, that within a month of arriving in Japan, the first thing that Zorge does, as well as befriend Eugen Ott, potentially very important source, is he also seduces his wife. <laughs> so I call him an impeccable spy, but there are many ways, and I'll get to the other ways in, uh, in a moment, that his work is very far from impeccable, in fact. Uh, he's actually incredibly reckless. 
despite the fact that this guy has seduced his wife, Eugen Ott, in fact, even jokes about it. He calls his new friend the irresistible one. Uh, there's obviously some sort of strange interpersonal dynamic in the in the Ott's relation in the family relations. But anyway, uh, the um, and um, Ott begin, begins to just confide in in Zorge. Zorge. Why does he confide in Zorge? Because Zorge actually becomes very good at networking. He becomes the go-to guy for Ott and other senior diplomats because he seems to be amazingly well informed about the ins and outs, the inner workings of Japanese politics. He's just like this amazingly well-connected journalist. And of course, the reason why he's an amazingly well-connected journalist, I think you got there before me, was because his major Japanese agent was a young, idealistic, communist Japanese journalist. Who, with whom he had worked and met, in fact, in, uh, in Shanghai, he, uh, Hotsumi Ozaki. He gets transferred to the headquarters of his newspaper, the Ozaki Shimbun, uh, and he gets transferred in, in, in the way of a certain kind of journalist. He goes from his career progression is from journalist to a sort of you know, analyst, sort of leader writer, to sort of think tanker to government advisor. I mean, that's not unprecedented, um, as we know from the current election. I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the path from journalism to politics has also existed in 1930s Japan. So you, you have the, uh, and, and ultimately, at the height of the spy rings, f effectiveness and fame, you have Richard Zorge is one degree of separation from Adolf Hitler via his best mate, Eugen Ott, with whom he has breakfast every morning at the embassy. And they chat about you know, the secret diplomatic cables that have come in from Berlin and what Zorge has, has heard about, um, uh, uh, about the sort of latest uh, gossip on Japanese politics. He's one degree of separation from Hitler, because Ott is speaking quite regularly to Hitler, goes to Berlin many times to meet Hitler. He's one degree of separation from the Japanese prime minister, because Hotsumi Ozaki uh, is uh, eventually appointed to what's called the the the, the, the breakfast club uh, or the the the, uh, the the breakfast council, where uh, the top senior government advisors meet with the prime minister. So he's one degree of separation from the Japanese prime minister, and he's also one degree of separation from Stalin, because he all this time is sending messages to Moscow headquarters, long voluminous encoded messages, which his boss, his immediate boss. There are actually many of them, um, were, is trying to, uh, communicates on a daily basis to Stalin. So he finds himself in one degree of separation from the Japanese Prime Minister, from Stalin, from Hitler. And the way he holds this all together is, because, is uh, I mean, you're all dealing with information and the value of it. Um, this is a classic example of a, a, a virtuous circle of information which becomes self-reinforcing. You know, the, the, the Zorge himself is reinforcing uh, his, his reputation as a brilliant sort of knowledgeable man about Japanese politics because of all the secret stuff that he's learning from his agent. The, his, his agent, Hatsumi Ozaki, develops a formidable reputation for knowing brilliantly, having incredible insight into the workings of the Western, the Western powers because of the stuff that Zorge is, is passing to him. And all the time, uh, of course, in this circle, only Eugen Ott is the is the dupe, really, but he's also the only one that survives. Eugen Ott, uh, and, and, and all the sort of the cream of this, and all the secret stuff, is going straight to Moscow. So there's a really simple key to this, I mean, as well as being uh, his, his, his charm and personal skills and so on. But he just creates this information mill that just bigs up everyone, every participant, and, uh, and, and, and makes them all incredibly famous in their own fields without anyone really quite knowing why or where they got this brilliant information from. So the next question is, what, why is he important? What did he do that we, that we have such um, uh, General Douglas MacArthur, later the um, Viceroy, American Viceroy and Governor of Occupied Japan, he called Zorge a devastating example of a brilliant success of espionage. 
Uh, the spies in history who can say from their graves the information I supplied to my masters, for better or worse, altered the history of our planet, can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Richard Zorgate was in that group, says Frederick Forsyth. The best spy of all time, says Tom Clancy. The spy to end spies, says John le Carré, and his work was impeccable, that's where the, the title comes from, says Kim Philby. So what did he do that was so incredible and world-changing and important? One very simple thing. Um, it was not a simple thing. One very major thing. If anyone knows anything about Zorge, and in Russia and Japan both, he's actually world famous. It's, uh, in, in Britain, he's less well known. But if anyone happens to be a spy buff and happens to have heard about him, the one thing people know about Richard Zorge is that he warned Stalin that Hitler was going to invade in June, 1920, in June of, of 1941 and was not believed. That is true. Zorge did, in fact, warn the Soviets multiple times that plans for Barbarossa were advancing. He even knew which generals were, was able to pass on, which generals were in charge of which sections of the front. He knew more or less the date because Zorge was speaking regularly, not only to Ott, but to all the military attaches that were going backwards and forwards between Berlin and Tokyo through, through, the whole, through the whole period, through the months immediately preceding the Operation Barbarossa. Because, of course, if you think about it, unlikely though it may seem, the quickest way to go from Berlin to Tokyo is how? In, the, in 1941, spring of 1941, quickest way? I and mean, obviously you could fly, but train. Yeah, you get on the train to Vladivostok. That's the fastest way if you're going to try to cross land. And their allies from 1939 to 1941, the Soviet Union, and, the, and, and the Nazi Germany sign a non-aggression pact. It's called a non-aggression pact, but in fact, also, it's a military alliance. And they, and they carve up Europe, Eastern Europe between them, Poland, notably, and, and the Baltics. And the Soviet Union is, is supplying the uh, German war machine with enormous amount of, 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 of material, but also crucially allowing Asian material, soybeans and rubber, to cross on that very same train track. So Zorge is not, uh, not only sitting in the chancellery of the German embassy, reading their confidential memos and, and, and having daily chats with, 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 uh, with the ambassador, but he's also talking to his, to his friends and acquaintances and old mates who are coming through with various dispatches from Berlin. So he's very well informed. Uh, it must be said that Zorge was not the only person to warn Stalin of the danger. In fact, as we now know, there were 19 different agents uh, in various positions, including uh, a group of agents called the Rote Capella, the, 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 the Red Choir, who, was, uh, who were anti-Nazi officials in the, foreign, in the German foreign ministry, in the Luftwaffe, and so on, who were also reporting bits of crucial information. And all of this was going back to uh, st uh, the headquarters of Russian military intelligence, and it was being reported to Stalin. Stalin did not believe it. Why? This is a very interesting part of the story, and as, since everyone in this room is actually t engaged with information and the uses and misuses of information. Uh, it's a really salutary tale and a terrifying one. Because why didn't Stalin believe all of these reports that were coming in warning him, dozens of them, over months, Hitler is really going to invade. He's going to invade here. Details like forensic details, like Luftwaffe is as ordered, you know, 10,000 Messerschmitt engines, like, you know, real forensics. How is this ignored? Very simple, because Hitler's, because Stalin's intelligence chiefs are too scared to tell him something that he doesn't want to hear. It's a classic example of groupthink. I mean, there have been other examples. I mean, if, if you read um, Bob Woodward's accounts of how the Iraq war was, uh, uh, was, was fought and so on, this idea of, of a clique of people around the leader who become obsessed and particularly the intelligence professionals become obsessed with providing or filtering in information that the leader, you become convinced that the, the boss does not want to hear that the Germans are going to invade. Therefore, everything that 
his intelligence chief, this man called Philip Golikov, General Philip Golikov, uh, edits the information that he's receiving from Zorge and from all the Rota Capella and all these other agents. And he fillets it out. And he, f he leaves in the bits, because if you read the originals, you see that you know, every intelligence report, it's not, you know, it's never a slam dunk. It's always like, on the one hand, but you know, this other person says, you know, they're, 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 they're always hedged in some way. So what he does is he sort of takes all the bits which are hedging against an invasion and puts those in his report, Golikov's report to Stalin. And all the bits that are mitigated, that, 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 are, uh, that, are, that, that are, to our hindsight, enlightened minds, strong evidence that actually it's really going to happen, that part he either frames as, uh, he either puts disclaimers in, or he just leaves out altogether. And uh, so the, the result is that actually several, or he discredits the source. So indeed, um, on one of the reports, and one of the uh, Stalin writes, and in fact, it's one of the interesting and very chilling things about looking through the Soviet archives, is that Stalin has a very distinctive handwriting. And he always writes in very thick blue or, uh, or red wax pencil. And uh, so you, you're leafing through these documents, and you just see, like, that's, you know, Stalin wrote on that. And he says, like, you can send your source to his mother, Stalin. <laughs> you know, he's an ST, he sounds him, signs himself. So, you know, he's, which, which is, you know, fairly strong dis disapprobation. So, so Stalin actually has, um, is, is being fed this, this disinformation from, you know, this skewed information by his intelligence chief. Why, is the, why does that happen? Because General Filip Golikov, was the seventh head of Soviet military intelligence in uh, five years. The previous six were all executed. So clearly, that's not a great job. Or <laughs> to put it more specifically, there are certain things that his six predecessors did that obviously were rather badly wrong. So, um, Thematically, they d all did various things to displease Stalin. They all themselves became victims of the purges, along with hundreds of thousands of other members of the party. Basically, from 1937 onwards till, 19, till well into the 40s, you have this mentality of the purges, which, of course, is another kind of groupthink, and another toxic kind of groupthink. Because you have an, a, a, an, uh, an intelligence organization, Soviet military intelligence, uh, or, and the secret police, the NKVD. You have the party, the organ of government. All of the major institutions of the Soviet state are suddenly consumed with this paranoia, deadly paranoia, that somebody is, going, is either a saboteur or a spy, and, or an enemy. And of course, as we now know with, with, with hindsight, what they really all were were enemies in one way, shape, or form of Stalin, or that's how it started at least. So it wasn't really about saboteurs or spies. It was just about political. It's all about purging the political opponents in the party. But the result, the operational result, is that you have swathes of senior officers within the Fourth Department, which is the, the, the contemporary name for the Soviet military intelligence, are just rounded up and murdered, shot accused, convicted, and so on. Zorge was one of the very few Soviet agents to survive. Because at the end of 1938, a call went out to every Soviet field agent, what they call them uh bureau chiefs all around the world, saying, come back to Moscow. And by this point, uh, because it was 1938, already the purges had already been in full swing for a year. So some of them got wise. Some of them, didn't, some of them refused to return. Um, some of them returned, including people like Theodore Marley, who was the recruiter of the Cambridge Five and so on. You know, very brilliant, some of the greatest spies the Soviet Union has ever produced. Um, were, went back to Moscow and were imprisoned uh, and, and shot. Uh, we, uh, the ones that refused to go back were all themselves hunted down and murdered, Mossad style. Often, uh, the latest one was, in, like, was murdered in like, 1961. I mean, the, 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 the KGB really held, had, had a long memory. They were, they were hunted down and, and murdered. Um, with one exception, that exception is Zorge, who, 
as well as being charming and extremely uh, clever and manipulative, also very importantly has just the devil's own luck. He just gets away with so much egregious shit, it's extraordinary. <laughs> and one of the things that he does is completely unbeknown to him, and he, he doesn't really think this through, but he agrees to go. He's like, yes, I'm going. He says, he agrees to the summons. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. Like, yes, except that my agent, Hatsumi Ozaki, is in Manchuria at the moment on a reporting expedition. He's not going to be back till the, the end of the month, and I have to debrief him, and like, you know, and, you know, so, but he, so, so he, he, not deceitfully, but actually je truthfully says, gives them reasons why he's not going to go right now. And by the time he actually is ready to go, they don't want him to go, to, to, to go back anyway. Is that, it's, 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 it's over. The, the, the guy who summoned him has been shot. <laughs> Seriously. And, and then his success has also been shot. And then his successor's success has been shot. One of, them, one of the heads of the fourth department lasts last for 20 days in, in August of, 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 19, of 1939. But, um, and then it's all over, and he's still in, in Turkey. But everyone that, he's, that he knows, everyone he's ever, he's ever worked with, everyone who, who knows him, and anyone who, who, who even knows people that he's worked with, they're all gone. They're all, they're all in execution pits. They're completely decapitated, not only their own party apparatus, not only their own security apparatus, but, but, um, and, their, and their army senior staff, which puts them in a very bad position when they start to fight, fight a war with the Finns in 1940. They've also totally decapitated their, uh, decapitated their, own, uh, their, their own security apparatus. They've sort of, Zorge is, in situ, finding, feeding them with some of the greatest high-grade intelligence that any spy has ever provided to his masters. And yet at the top, there's this sort of knot of paranoia and disbelief. And the people who are running the intelligence that's getting to the top, to Stalin, are obsessed, not totally unreasonably, with their own survival, uh, instead of actually telling, telling the boss the truth. So the result is that Stalin indeed does not know what, uh, that, that is blindsided um, by Operation Barbarossa. The, the, they, within, within two weeks, the Russian Soviet troops are already charging through to, to, to Smolyansk, et cetera. And we, we know the story of the blitzkrieg sweeps across the plains of Western Russia. Zorge, by the way, by, by that time, has been proved right because, I mean, a hundred German divisions crossing the Soviet border is a somewhat sort of hard to ignore piece of evidence that mitigating in the, that, that he actually, okay, he was actually telling the truth. But the next question to Zorge is, okay, so we know the Japanese, the, the, the Germans have invaded us, what are the Japanese going to do? Because the Japanese are Germany's allies. The Japanese have two and a half million men under arms in direct proximity to the Soviet Union. And we now know I mean, it's, it's really clear. I mean, I don't think any serious historian would dispute this. The, if the Japanese had invaded Siberia, the Soviet Union, in the summer of 1941, in tandem with their German allies, there was, there was absolutely no way that Stalin could have fought a war on two fronts. The war would have been absolutely lost. So the question for Zorge, you know, June 23rd, the day after Barbarossa, is why, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the Japanese going to do? And Zorge is able, by throwing all of his espionage resources into the breach, to confirm you know, by late summer that Japan is actually definitively not going to invade the Soviet Union for a really interesting practical reason. Uh, the army, there's been a uh, long back and forth strategic debate for years between the Japanese army and the Japanese navy. The Japanese army is on land. It wants to continue pushing through China. Japanese navy is obviously on the sea, and then it wants to continue pushing through by sea through Southeast Asia to uh, uh, the Dutch East Indies, to the Philippines, to uh, French Indochina, and so on. The Navy wins the strategic debate. Why? Because Japan is running out of oil. Japan has no oil to run its war machine. The, Jap the, the Americans have blockaded. In fact, in, in some ways, the Japanese if you go to the, uh, to the uh, Japanese equivalent of the Imperial War Museum, the narrative is amazingly that actually the Americans started the Second World War against Japan, not the other way around, uh, because the, and that Pearl Harbor was retaliation for an act of war, which was the Japanese, the, the American blockade of oil. 
which which ensued in in the, in, in 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 July of 1941. So, uh, and in fact, under the Geneva Convention, a blo an economic blockade is in fact technically an act of war. So they have a point in their own minds. So the uh, you know. Um, Unusual to think of Pearl Harbor as a sort of self-defense move, but anyway, that's how that's how some Japanese saw it and see it to this day. But the point is that the uh, uh, the blockade is actually economically devastating, and compels the Japanese to take the Dutch East Indies. They cannot continue fighting the war. They cannot continue lighting their houses or heating them, them without that oil. So rather as Hitler, so the, the, you know, the Marxists do have a point. There is very strong material, materialistic element to world history. The, the Hitler was driven to the oil fields of Baku to fuel his war machine. And that was why he uh, um, drove towards Stalingrad and towards Baku, the place of Richard Zorgo's birth. And so the Japanese didn't invade the Soviet Union in 1941 because they were driven towards the, they had, they had to get the oil fields of Batavia. Anyway, to, to long story short, we're going to get to the questions in a second. Um, Zorge is able to tell his Soviet masters for sure that Japan is not going to invade that summer, which is enormously important because it allows the Germans, the, 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 the Soviet high command, to withdraw the up to five army corps to the defense of Moscow. And as we now know, actually, Hitler lost the war, not at Stalingrad, not at Kursk, not, not anywhere else, but actually at Moscow. Moscow was the last point where he could have won the Second World War if he'd taken Moscow in the winter of 1941. He didn't because it was reinforced by Siberian troops. Hence, you know, all the sort of world historical significance of Richard Zorge. So that is the thing that he does that puts him into, uh, into the... Um, uh, into the category of world-class spies. But the, um, I just want to leave you with uh, two things. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm personally fascinated by his, uh, the personality um, of a man that can spend nine years of his life lying to everybody around him, literally everybody. He has a Japanese mistress uh, but who doesn't know about his espionage activities or his Soviet wife. Even his closest spying colleague, Hotsumi Ozaki, he lies to him too. Uh, Zorge tells him that he's working for the Communist International, not for Soviet military intelligence. He has this almost pathological desire to deceive. And also running in parallel with that, this extraordinary desire for danger and self-destruction. And I, mean, I, I said he got away with all sorts of egregious, crazy things. One of the crazy things that he got away with was that he one of his favorite pastimes was getting extremely drunk and driving a very powerful motorcycle at high speed, um, uh, usually with girls on the back. This is his, his major seduction technique. In fact. And, um, and so he had this enormously powerful Zundap flat twin, uh, 500cc, very powerful motorcycle, which actually weighs, uh, it weighs 180 kilos. It's a, really, it's a real monster. And he drives this at speeds of 100 miles an hour. And at one point, he completely drunk, having drunk uh, at least a bottle and a half of whiskey. He crashes this thing into a wall. He doesn't, he doesn't even crash. He just doesn't notice the wall. He just drives into the wall. Um, and, the law, and the wall wins. And he breaks his jaw horrifically. And he's taken to hospital. And he um, stays conscious, forces himself to stay conscious, calls for his friend, uh, a, a, friend uh, a colleague from the German embassy, comes to He summons his mate who, unbeknown to the colleague from the German embassy, is actually his radio man, a man called Max Clausen, a Moscow-trained radio man, German communist, who's working with Zorge. He says, call Max Clausen. He stays awake long enough to, Max Clausen's a sharp, and he says, like, Max, like, check my jacket. Because in his jacket pocket, the sometimes impeccable, but not always impeccable spy, has a radio, has a message written on Claire in English, because he communicates for strange reasons with, with Moscow Center in English, in his jacket pocket, which is just there, like the, the, his spy message, his report, which he's just left in his pocket. And he gets away with it. And, he, and, and on, the, on the night of Operation Barbarossa, he gets drunk at the Imperial Hotel, stands up on the table, and tells an audience of Nazis, uh, Hitler is a, is a bandit. You, this is the end of him. Stalin, Stalin will... will, will, will will be the end, you know, we'll, we'll put an end to your criminal activities, he shouts. 
To which point everyone says, like, ha, 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 like a crazy old Richard, who's also the only person, by the way, who is, I think, simultaneously a member of the Soviet Communist Party and the German Nazi Party at the same time. <laughs> but I'll leave you with, uh, uh, I'll, leave, I'll give, leave the last word to Le Carre. Uh, because John Le Carre wrote a very brilliant uh, review, in fact, of the first ever book in English to be published about Zorgin. And I think he nailed, John Le Carre nailed him uh, in a way that uh, I have not been able to better. Uh, he was a man's man, and like most self-appointed romantics, he had no use for women outside the bedroom. He was an entertainer. People, even his victims, loved him. Soldiers warmed to him immediately. He was an exhibitionist, I suppose, and the audience was always of his own sex. He had courage, great courage, and a romantic sense of mission. When his colleagues were arrested, he lay in bed drinking sake, waiting for the end. He wanted to train as a singer. He's not the first spy to be recruited from the ranks of failed artists. A French journalist describes him as possessing a strange combination of charm and brutality. At times, he undoubtedly betrayed the symptoms of an alcoholic. What did spying give to him? A stage, I think, a ship to sail upon his own romantic seas, a string to tie together a bunch of middle-range talents, a fool's bladder with which to beat society, and a Marxist whip with which to scourge himself. This sensual priest had found his real métier. He was born wonderfully in his own century. Only his gods were out of date. Questions? Did he ever leave Tokyo and return to Russia or Germany, or did he meet his end in Japan? Um, sadly, he did not leave Tokyo, no. He, um, although strangely enough, actually one of the tantalizing things about writing about someone who's so secretive and so pathologically deceitful is that um, you, you only catch glimpses of the sort of the, the inner life, the true inner life, um, in the reports of conversations and so on. And I think there, there are indications that he had a bank account, by the way, in uh, his own personal bank account in Hong Kong. Um, he had, which is still operating, interestingly enough, even under Japanese occupation during the war. Um, he um, he certainly made um, talk to his 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 friends about about leaving, about bailing out, you know, during that sort of critical period at the end of 1941. Um, but the, the long, the, the, the short version is no, he never left. He never left Tokyo. He was, um, he was arrested by the merest chance, in fact, despite all of the extraordinary things that he did, he was, uh, all the extraordinary risks, the risks that he took. And also, uh, I didn't mention the, the butcher of Warsaw. Um, in um, 1941, the Germans become somewhat suspicious about this man who is this journalist who is so close to their ambassador. The Germans have been asking Zorge to write various economic reports and political reports on the political situation for the Germans. The Germans have been using him as a, as a source. And uh, as it turns out, there is some paperwork or some whiff of scandal concerned with Zorge's own communist youth in the 1920s, when he's still sort of roughhousing with all the, uh, with with the, um, with the, uh, uh, the communist insurgents in in, in Kiel and so on, and um, the um, deputy head of the SS uh, decides to send a man to check on Zorge, and the man he decides to send is a man called uh, is a Gestapo colonel called Josef Meisinger. And Josef Meisinger has the unusual distinction of of uh, of being a man whom the Gestapo want to hang for war crimes. Now, that's a very high bar, <laughs> but the, nonetheless, Meissinger manages it. He, um, um, he gets saved from his war crimes accusations by the Gestapo, um, the, the, by, the, the, uh, by his friends in the, in the SS, because he was actually a, an old first world war comrade of Heinrich Himmler. Anyway, long story short, they send Meisinger, Gestapo colonel, in a submarine, in a submarine to Japan to investigate Richard Zorge. So this is a man who is known as the Butcher of Warsaw. He makes a big social impression in, on his arrival in Tokyo by eating steak, raw steak with his fingers. 
He's generally a sort of terrifying man and uh, an incredibly dangerous opponent. And Zorge, of course, does what he does with everyone, is he takes him drinking and whoring in Ginza. And you know, within a couple of days, you know, he's, he's best mates with the Butcher of Warsaw. And, and, and turns out they're also uh, what the Germans call Kampfkameraden. They, they're actually with serving on the same section of the Western Front, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so the, um, he's... Uh, he 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 has this extraordinary, um, this extraordinary sort of uh, luck and and evades every possible jeopardy until the last minute. Uh, at the last minute, it's completely random. His turns out his agents, his Japanese agents, had been recruiting their own sub agents. So essentially, the Japanese who he works with and sees there are two of them. Um, uh, have themselves recruited other people unbeknown to Zorge. And this sort of secondary, well, sort of almost tertiary ring of agents are drawn from former communists, which is actually a very bad thing to do operationally, you know, you, because they're all known to the police and so on. And just completely randomly, one of a network of, in fact, several dozen sort of sub agents gets arrested, questioned by the police, and then they just sort of simply unravel all the way up the line. And they get uh, they get to Zorge's assistant, a guy called Miyagi. Miyagi names Ozaki, and names Zorge. So it's it's actually really ultimately, although he does lots of extraordinarily injudicious and dangerous things, it was ultimately through no fault of his own that Zorge gets caught. Thanks. So um, you've written about Zorge, who spied while posing as a correspondent abroad. <laughs> and you yourself, as I understand it, are a correspondent abroad. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One, are you concerned that you've sort of played yourself? <laughs> uh, but but more, more, um, more seriously, do you as a journalist face suspicion because of your profession? Are you concerned that uh, writing about famous spy journalists will make that worse? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, spent, I spent most of my um, most of my career um, uh, in Russia and in and in uh, I was I was based in, in Istanbul for 15 years and um, working mostly in, in in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, um, Russia, and I did mostly conflict journalism. So, so, so I covered wars in you know, um, Bosnia and Iraq and Iran and uh, Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan, all those places. Last one in eastern Ukraine. And the thing is, you realize that in, in sort of, uh, particularly in unstable um, countries, everyone thinks that you're a spy anyway. I mean, whether you can just be, whether you're an aid worker or, I mean, you know, every single Afghan, every single Syrian thinks that you're, every single Turk thinks that you're a spy of some kind. I mean, it's, it's just sort of a cultural sort of thing. But on the other hand, because it's assumed to be totally ubiquitous, they also doesn't seem, to, they don't you know, take it very seriously. But, but I mean, it, it actually is a problem because strangely enough, um, um, I have actually come across several people Posing as, I mean, rather rarely, but actually, on the, I think I would say three occasions in the field, I've come across people who claim to be journalists who are obviously not journalists, and it's really interesting because the, the, you know you can you just clock them immediately because you know they're, they're idiots, and you know they just haven't you know they don't they don't know what they're doing you know you, you, know, you have you know. Google, you know, just sort of, you know, they're, they're sort of pathetic sites which they've set up as covers. I mean, it, it, it's, it's immediately obvious that they, that, that, that these guys are not professionals. And uh, the, sort of the, the actual journalists, uh, they're like sort of white blood cells. They're just sort of, you know, you, know, you are fucking right off. Sorry, we're, you know, we're not having anything to do with you. Like, and, and, you t and you tell, like, sort of, sorry, like, don't take that guy. So, so actually, it's, it's, it's really quite hard to pose as a journalist. To be a journalist and a spy, I think, is probably quite easy because we do exactly the same job. But you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at how amazingly badly informed uh, diplomats and indeed the very few spies, that, actual professional spies that I know, how badly informed they are. Journalists are much better at knowing the country just because they have incredibly different, you know, we know much wider acquaintance. And, and uh, you know, they, I, I'm not even entirely sure what spies actually do anymore in terms of like human intelligence spies. Because as we know, um, I mean, as, 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 as you know, much better than I, um, you know, data mining I and mean, the whole Bellingcat story, I don't know whether you've, you know, you know, you know what Bellingcat is. 
Did anyone not know what pancake? Oh my god. Okay, sorry. People, you need to work. You need to. You need, you need to read about Bellingcat. Bellingcat is extraordinary because it just shows you the future of intelligence. Who set up this uh, organization, which uses um, citizen journalism to gain extraordinary accurate forensics on an intelligence. The, most, the thing they're most famous for is the MH17 downing. So it turns out, like, so uh, a missile is fired from a field in eastern Ukraine that knocks out, uh, a civilian airliner out of the sky. June, June 19, 2014. I was, I was there, actually. It was incredibly horrific. But anyway, a lot different story. But the, um, uh, uh, the Bellingcat is able to establish by cross-referencing, you know, uh, social media posts uh, uh, of the tractor of the Volvo truck that tows this book uh, rocket ar um, array into Ukraine and, and and tracks it. Like it's spotted here at this point, you know, and, and the image is is is, is time logged and it's, and here and here and here and here. And then on its way back, and here, and here, and here, and here. And then, like, where did it come from? Well, like, well they look, look through sort of Russian soldiers' social media posts. And they see, like, oh, this is, this is the same book. And actually, it's in this, this army base. Anyway, the, the, an enormous array of data points, all open source, uh, pr produce this extraordinarily compelling and essentially sort of impossible to fake picture of actually what really happened. And in fact, that's actually much more forensically interesting and useful than having like, a spy who's telling you, you know, this, this, this happened or that happened. So, um, and, and in fact, very interestingly, I mean, and most recently, the, you know, the, um, the Bellingcat people also identified the Skripal would-be assassins by, you know, brilliantly, they, 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 they ran the, uh, the information from, which the British police published, the fake passports that they used. Uh, the, the, the two as would be assassins of Skripal, they, they, they published, they, they, they put them out as a, in a press release. So Bellingcat says, well, this is interesting, using, using a Russian partner. Let's just see if any of this information on the passports is true. And it turns out that the first name and the middle name and the, pa and the place of birth and the date of birth of one of the two fake passports which, by the way, have consecutive serial numbers. Like, they're so fake. <laughs> I, I mean, they're not fake. They're, they're, they're just they're, they're real passports. But they're, you know, they're obviously like sort of generated deliberately for this operation. And um, is actually exactly the same first name, second name, uh, place, place, date of birth as a person who happens to work in uh, Russian military intelligence. Like, oh, amazing. <laughs> like, so, so, so then, having discovered this guy's real name, they then like l l look at look at his. Look, look up his, you know, the, the open source data of like, you know, where does he live? He lives, he has a flat in St. Petersburg. What's his car registration? Okay, what's his car registration? So they find the car, where's where that car registered to uh, the pay, pay its road taxes? Oh, it's registered to the headquarters of this Department of, 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 of Russian Military Intelligence in, on, on, in central Moscow. Oh, and what are the other cars registered to that address? Oh, the other 380 people who work there. You know, so all this like crazy stuff is just out there lying on the surface and you just need to sort of pick it apart. No one just, you know, no, no one's guarding against that stuff. But I mean, that's the future of, of intelligence, uh, not, not human. Intelligence. I mean, but the, 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 it's, it's all it's all in the data, and if you if you if you if you know where to look, you just you know everything. So, just talking about data for a moment. Um, yeah, I mean, he Google. he lived in an age where um, it must have been hard for you to find data. Did he leave a footprint of all the people he seduced, all the people he drank with? Did they write about him? Yeah. Well, actually, one one of the great uh, he didn't write about them, but they wrote about, he, he didn't they didn't write, didn't write about him. He wrote about them. And one of the, one of the things that actually that that's, that makes it sort of easy and also challenging uh, is that actually every member of the spy ring is arrested. Every member of the spy ring, but one, sings like a canary. They actually in captivity for different reasons. Actually, um, the radio man spills the beans because he and it, because actually, unfortunately for Zorge, the radio man Max Clausen, having started off as a communist, actually goes into business using Soviet money, 
that becomes a very successful businessman, buys his wife fur coats, and decides that actually he's not actually a communist after all, he's actually a Nazi. So that becomes a bit of a problem if you're actually a professional Soviet intelligence officer and, and, uh, uh, and, and causes a bit of a fundamental contradiction. So, so he's actually trying to prove to his interrogators, Max Clausen, the radio man, is trying to prove that he's actually a Nazi. Zorge is trying to get swapped by Moscow. So he's trying to prove to his, to his masters what a great, loyal communist he is. In fact, because he's expecting to be exchanged ultimately, um, which he's not. The Russians totally disown him. They screw him completely. So uh, all, all the members of the spy ring actually confess, in Zorge's case, at, at enormous length. He literally writes an almost book-length memoir in, during the two years that he's in jail. So they all have very, uh, they, they all have very uh, uh, extensive sort of s s writings about themselves. Um, and also, as we now know, the Japanese, from the, almost from the first moment of, their, uh, um, uh, of the spy ring's activities, had been transcribing. They identified the transmitter. They didn't know where exactly where it was, but they were listening in to the transmissions. And this is so Japanese. From like 1932 until 1941, they are transcribing thousands and thousands of streams, meaningless numbers, which are being transmitted like clickety click, click, click. So letters, so it's a click, 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 by in code. And they just don't know, they don't know what it is, but they just keep transcribing it for years. <coughs> and they have this gigantic archive. Like, and, and then finally they reach, they, they, they find the operating set, they find Max Clausen, and they find a very well-thumbed copy of the German Statistical Handbook from 1933. And, 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 they, said, and they put two and two together, and they actually are now able to de decipher these sort of seven years' worth of random numbers they've been painstakingly writing down. So we also have literally the entire Everything that, that Zorge ever sent to Moscow Center is also chronicled. So there is actually a, a lot of material. Thank you very much, Eric. My great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.